Um, well, again, uh, it's just a joy to be here with you today. I'm glad uh, that I'm thankful to have the opportunity to share in the, our final week of our series called A Way Out. And throughout this series, we've been talking about temptation. Now, we all know temptation comes in many different ways at many different times to different people. Like some of you are tempted by food. As you, if, you, if you were here at all, then you know that I have a problem with dirt cake. Um, so some of you have a problem with dirt cake and, uh, or some other kind of food. And others of you are like, I could literally drive by a Dunkin' Donuts seven days a week, three times a day, and never be tempted to stop. Whereas people like me are always tempted to stop, right? But again, we're all tempted by different things. Some of you say, I might be tempted to cheat on my taxes, But others of you say, I'm not tempted to do that. I just feel like it's my duty to contribute my part to help make our society work and function. And the only way that's going to happen is if people are willing to pay their fair share. Temptation looks different for each one of us. But the thing about temptation that's consistent across the board is that everyone is tempted. And in week one, we define temptation as anything that promises satisfaction at the cost of obedience to God. And every single one of us is tempted. In fact, even Jesus was tempted. And so because we don't want to be people who are falling into temptation, we want to be prepared for it. We want to be intentional to not only defend ourselves against temptation, but also to actively order our lives so that we are spiritually strong against temptation. Because here's the thing. Sometimes temptation can kind of be towards something insignificant, right? If it doesn't necessarily lead to sin, then temptation is, you know, okay, so I'm tempted to eat dirt cake. What's it matter, right? Um, But other times, the things we're tempted to can can be things that entrench us in an addiction and can threaten to ruin our lives if we don't figure something out. But the something out, the good news that we've been leaning on and trusting in throughout the series is the key promise of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, where Paul says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is what God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Our God is faithful. He will always provide a way out of our temptation every single time. And in week two, we talked about fighting temptation defensively. We want to stay far away from temptation. We don't want to go anywhere near it. We want to run from it, right? The question we asked was, why resist the temptation tomorrow that we have the power to eliminate today? And so if, you're, if your temptation is for chips and you don't want to have any chips in your house at all, like just don't buy them. And in fact, whenever you go to the grocery store, the, the beautiful people at the grocery store, they, they actually labeled the row. They put right there on the row, chips, right? Snacks. Candy, so you can just say, I'm, I'm not going down that row. <laughs> if you're anything like me, I go into the grocery I, Somebody told me I'm not supposed to do this, but I always go into the grocery store and I buy and I get something off a shelf and I eat it while I'm shopping. Is that bad? <laughs> I pay for it whenever I'm done. So, anyway, if you go down the aisle, you might be tempted now to grab a bag of potato chips, crack it open, and then start snacking on your way out. If that's illegal, please come let me know. I don't think it is. We, I always pay for it. I'm not buying grapes or bananas or anything. I'm buying like, you know, granola bars. I'm hungry, all right? You're not supposed to shop on an empty stomach because then you buy more stuff. So I'm doing my duty to the family budget. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that one there. We want to fight offensively. We want to be spiritually strong. Not only do we want to fight defensively, staying away from it, we also want to fight offensively. We want to be spiritually strong. Andy had a great analogy. If we want to have a a lush, green, full lawn, we don't just want to kill the weeds. We don't want to just pull them up. We don't just want to spray them. Because if you just do that, 
then you just have an empty, fertile soil for the neighbor's dandelion seed to float over and land in, to take root and grow, and you just have more weed. So we want to be defensive, but we also want to be offensive. And so we want to plant grass. We want to fertilize. Because weeds are like rabbits, right? You start with two, and you don't think that's too bad. They're kind of cute, right? One dandelion. It's kind of cute. But before you know it, you have 22. And they're leaving their little stuff all over the yard, and the dog is out of control. So we want to be spiritually strong to resist temptation. And one of the ways we said in week, in week two to be spiritually strong is to submit ourselves to God. Put ourselves under God's authority. And I shared this prayer with you. God, I give you my hands to do your work. I give you my feet to go your way. I give you my eyes to see what you see. I give you my, my mouth, my tongue to, um, to speak your words. I give you my mind to think on things that are good. And I give you my spirit to strengthen me. Part of fighting temptation offensively is submitting ourselves to God. And Andy said last week that one of the ways we can be spiritually strong is by feeding on the Spirit of God. Walk in step with the Holy Spirit. Listen to his nudges. Lean on him for strength. And today we're going to continue on in our offensive approach to temptation. We're going to continue to unpack how to be spiritually strong against temptation by attaching ourselves to God. To set the tone for today's message, I want to tell you a story. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an Enneagram 7. I don't know if any of you guys do Enneagram at all. Um, but Enneagram 7s are just like constantly doing new things. So it's, it's nice because um, preaching, every time I preach, I have like a different story of something new I'm doing. And it's all true, but in a month I might not be doing it anymore. So just don't get too married to the things that I'm doing. But a, a couple of months ago, um, a friend and I have started to climb over at the climbing gym in State College. Um, and if you've ever seen a rock wall, you know that most of the time, unless it's in that movie Free Solo on Netflix, the documentary about the guy at El Capitan and, and Yosemite, right? Most of the time when somebody's rock climbing, they're not just climbing up all willy-nilly. You have to be attached to a harness, and the harness is attached to a rope, and the rope goes up to the top and around a pulley, comes back down, and there's hopefully a person standing at the other end with a harness and a device that lets them belay you, right? And, and, and it's called top rope because the rope's on the top. And um, in top rope, the rope is crucial, because if you can't make it anymore on your own, or if you slip off of your hold, you're connected to the rope. And you're caught by the person who's belaying you on the other end of the rope. Now, whenever I climb, I go with my friend Scotty. Um, we go a couple times a week. He belays me. I belay him. And whenever I climb, at the very beginning, whenever I'm just getting warmed up, I'm climbing the easy, the easy um, routes, right? And it's a breeze, right? You can climb up it pretty quick. It's not a problem. It's very easy. And sometimes whenever I'm climbing, there will actually be slack that starts to form in the rope because I'm climbing faster than he can get the rope going. But as I'm climbing, it doesn't really matter because I'm at the easy part. I'm at the part that I can pretty much do by myself, even if there wasn't a rope, I probably wouldn't fall. I mean, I'm not saying take the rope off, but I'm just saying I don't really need the rope as much as I do other times, maybe. And so I'm climbing, and there's slack that's developing in the rope. And so if I do slip, I won't fall because the rope's still connected. But, but after an hour of climbing, when your hands start shaking, I don't know if you've ever done anything like this, like a church camp or something, and, and your fingers can barely hold onto a doorknob, let alone a small uh, crimp on the edge of a, of a wall. I'm making sure there's no slack in that rope. I'm like, pull it tighter, Scotty, right? Because I know that at any moment I am going to need that rope. I'm counting on that rope to hold me up. In fact, sometimes whenever I'm belaying my children, and they're getting tired, there's a, there's a blurry line between whether they're climbing the wall or if I'm just like pulling them up the wall, right? 
That's, I wish Scotty, Scotty, can you get a little stronger? Because I could, I could use you just pulling me up the wall a little bit. We could get over some of those hard spots, right? Scotty can't quite pull me up the wall, but I need that rope and I need Scotty because I know there's a good chance at some point during the climb that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose my grip and I need him to catch me or else I'm going to fall. My strength isn't enough on its own. I could be strong for a while. I've actually thought about that whenever I'm climbing and I get to the top and I'm like, oh gosh, I hope this, they have like auto belays where it's just like a machine that belays you. There are times at the top where I'm like, maybe I should just climb back down. Right? Like, I don't know if I can trust that thing. Maybe I should just climb back down. But most of the time, um, all the time, I really need that rope. Because I can be strong for a while, and we can be strong against temptation for a while, but eventually we'll find ourselves in a moment of weakness. Perhaps we'll find ourselves consistently weak to the same things over and over again. And sometimes whenever we fall into temptation, it's because we forgot to attach ourselves to the one who makes us strong. The one whose power is made perfect in our weakness. Now, if you're climbing on a rock wall, you are going to need the rope sometimes. Or else you are going to fall. All over the gym, there are signs that say, climbing is dangerous. And and even if you're on a route that you've done dozens of times that should be a beginner route and you're advanced or whatever... Sometimes the holds, there's like signs that say, hey, just so you know, the holds on the wall, they can come unscrewed. And so even if you feel good about it, you could still slip and fall. So don't sue us. That's what they're saying. But, but even if it's a route that's supposed to be easy, it's possible that there are going to be times you're probably going to slip. And if you're not attached you're going to fall. And the same is true with temptation. We need to attach ourselves to God, the one whose power is made perfect in our weakness. And when we attach ourselves to God, we're more resilient to stand strong against temptation. And we're still going to be tempted, right? Just like on the climbing wall, we're still going to slip. But we'll be less likely to fall because we've attached ourselves to the source of strength. Our God, our God who's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who's with us right now and anywhere we go. And today, um, I'm going to share with you three things we can do to help attach ourselves to God so that we can be spiritually strong. And I want to be honest with you. First of all, none of this is going to be new. None of this is going to be like, wow, I've never heard this before, okay? But likely there are going to be some things that you're like, you know what, I know I, I, I've heard this before, but I, I really need to be more intentional about it. Because if I'm being honest with myself, it's easy to get out of the discipline. And that's the thing about discipline is it takes work, right? But the reality is no one ever stumbled into righteousness. No one ever trips and falls and finds themselves, wow, look at me. I'm, my life, I look just like Jesus. That's why we call it, we fall into temptation, Nobody ever falls into Christ-likeness. We fall into temptation. We don't fall into righteousness. And so we want to be intentional to do the work that's necessary, trusting in the power of the Holy Spirit. The first thing we're going to do to help us be spiritually stronger against temptation is to feed our spirit with God's Word. Psalm 119, 9 to 11 says, Uh, the psalmist who's King David, he says, how can a young person or old person, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? The answer is by living according to your word. And he says, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. And then he says this, I love this, I love this word, this, uh, this uh, phrase. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. We don't fight temptation by doing what everybody else around us is doing. We do it by hiding God's word in our heart. 
We, we, we need to feed on God's word to fight temptation. We need to immerse ourselves in God's word because it's through God's word that God shows us his character. It's through his word that he directs our lives. It's through his word that he teaches us how to live life to the fullest. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the author says this about God's word. It says, the word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. God's word isn't an, an, a distant, irrelevant text that we're just reading today. We believe, as, as followers of Jesus, we believe that, that God is present in his word. That it is living, that it is active, and that when we're reading God's word, we're not just reading words on a page, but the Holy Spirit is with us. And, and, and through reading his word, God changes our hearts from the inside. Uh, Paul wrote to his protege, Timothy, in a letter he wrote called 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. He says, all scripture is God-breathed. It's inspired by God. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the servant of God, that's you, if you're a follower of Jesus, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. If we want to be equipped to follow Jesus and to resist temptation, we need to feed our spirit on God's word. Jesus demonstrated this beautifully for us at the beginning of his ministry. Uh, he, he went out into the desert to be tempted by Satan and God's word was his weapon of choice against the enemy. He had been fasting for 40 days, and so naturally he was very hungry. And Satan said to him in Matthew chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, he said, If you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Prove it. Feed yourself. And Jesus said, man shall not live on, he said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, he didn't, he didn't cite it, but he could have said Deuteronomy 8.3, because that's right where that came from. Jesus was tempted, and he responded by quoting Scripture. Second temptation in verse 5 to 7 says, the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the highest point of the temple, and Satan said, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, also quoting scripture, which is interesting, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. In other way, Jesus, you have a belay. Trust in the rope. No. Um, and Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Deuteronomy 6.16. Satan tried to use scripture to trick Jesus, but Jesus wasn't having it. And he, he hid God's word in his heart, and he quoted scripture. And again, third time, verses 8 to 10. The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. And he offered them to Jesus, and he said, All this I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And again, he didn't say this, but he could have said Deuteronomy 6.13. See, God's word is our secret weapon against temptation. Whenever I'm tempted to believe that God wouldn't want to forgive me for the things that I do wrong, I remind myself of 1 John 1, 9 that says, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. When I'm, when I'm tempted to believe that God doesn't, doesn't love my enemies and that person who bothers me or annoys me or who wrongs me, that he doesn't want good things for them too, like he wants for me, I remember 1 Timothy 2, 4 that said, God wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. God's word is our secret weapon against temptation. And so if you want to be spiritually strong against temptation, you need to feed your spirit with God's word. Read God's word. Read the Bible. If you're not already immersing yourself in scripture, and I don't want to oversell that. I said immersing. That's a real churchy word. If you're not already spending time reading the Bible sometimes, right, this doesn't have to be an hour-long endeavor. 
If you're not already reading the Bible on a regular basis, buy a devotional. Start a Bible reading plan in the Bible app on your phone. Or just open up the Bible and and open up to a book like the book of uh, Luke or John that just tells the story of Jesus. And just read through it and, and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you and encourage you. Read God's Word. You can memorize God's Word. Now, that's a scary thing, isn't it? I know that sounds hard. In our world, I remember growing up, you probably, many of you remember this too, the teacher said, "Why, well, sorry teachers, you're not going to have a calculator and everywhere you go in the world. And I'm like, yes I do. <laughs> Joke's on you. I didn't need to learn that stuff. <laughs> and it's really hard in our world. We don't memorize a whole lot anymore, do we? We don't need to memorize a map. We just follow the little blue dot on Google Maps. I used to feel like I couldn't memorize scripture But then I realized I have all the lyrics of my favorite songs memorized. I have all the lines from my favorite Adam Sandler movie memorized when I was in high school, right? Like I can quote that. I stand up here and say a whole lot about it. But I I can't memorize scripture. It's too hard. It's too hard. And then I got to college. And uh, my undergrad is in youth ministry with a, a minor in biblical studies. And our professor said, very first class, the Old Testament with Dr. Acker, he said, all right, so by the end of the semester, you have to memorize the entire uh, uh, chapter one, the first psalm, the whole chapter. I was like, I don't think I'm cut out for ministry. (laughs) And I took a long time, but I eventually memorized it. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree planted near streams of water, who yields its fruit in season, but not so the wicked. And the psalm continues on, and frankly, I don't remember the rest of it. But I'll be honest, as I was preparing the sermon, I was like, I wonder if I still remember Psalm 1. And I was like, wow, that came back to me really easily. And I want to encourage you, if I can memorize scripture... You can memorize scripture, okay? Um, And that's what we had to do in in Bible college was we had to memorize scripture. Memorize scripture. If I can do it, you can do it. And then you'll have it ready. You'll have it ready whenever you, you need to recall it to your memory in times of temptation. Whenever you need guidance or strength in your life. Maybe a good verse to start with is our verse for the series, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Out in the lobby, we have next steps, um, which kind of help you unpack the sermon and, and take a next step with it. Um, they're also available online um, on the digital bulletin. Um, but the very, first, um, the very first thing on the next step says, commit to memory 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide, say it with me, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. And so you're standing at the aisle, aisle 13, wherever it is at the grocery store, and you see all those chips. And you say, no temptation. And in the serious ones too, in the serious temptations. But to be spiritually strong against temptation, we need to feed our spirit with God's word. The second thing you can do to be spiritually strong against temptation is feed our spirit with prayer. In Matthew chapter 26, right before Jesus was betrayed into the hands of Pontius Pilate by his disciple Judas, he went into the garden of Gethsemane and he prayed. And we see a little bit of this encounter in Matthew 26 verses 36 to 38. It says this, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter, and he took the two sons of Zebedee, who are James and John, along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Jesus is about to face the Roman death penalty. Like like the idea of being crucified on a cross wasn't lost on him. It wasn't like this like thing that we can't even really imagine. I mean, we've seen Pat, maybe we've seen Passion of the Christ, so maybe you can imagine a little bit, right? But for them it was it was the um, it was the execution method of the day. And so along 
at times along the streets when somebody's going to be crucified, they wanted to deter other people from breaking the law. And so they did crucifixions publicly. Like we don't see crucifixions today. We only hear about them. And they're painless, which is, I don't know how to say this, it's great. You know, I mean, it's humane, which is probably a good thing. Um, But that's not how it was. And so Jesus knew this crucifixion was upon him. He knew what was coming to him. And he was going to do it for for the salvation of humanity. But in the garden, we see this, this struggle to submit his will to the will of God the Father's. Did you hear the language? It's heavy. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow, even to the point of death. You know, we said... <clears throat> we've said since the beginning of the series that Jesus is tempted in every way we are, right? But it's kind of like, um, until we read a story like this, it's hard to imagine Jesus actually being tempted, right? Like if you come up here and ask me, like whenever Jesus is, um, whenever Jesus is in the desert with Satan, he kind of almost has like a superhero feel to it, right? Like Satan's like in a little red with his like, you know, pitchfork thing and two horns and he's like you know Jesus come on over here man like you want to do this bad thing over here with me and Jesus is like Bible guy right hands on the hips no and it's like were you actually tempted or is it a technicality because you were offered the thing but like I don't know about you but whenever I'm tempted we're not talking about a technicality of like somebody offered me a puff and I'm like oh no thank you right I'm talking about I actually have a desire to do the thing, and I'm not convinced from what, I'm not saying I'm not convinced. From what we read in the story in the desert with Jesus being tempted, there's nothing that shows us Jesus even wanted to do it. It'd be like you coming up and saying to me, hey, David, I'm tempting you to give me $1,000. And I'd be like, guess what? That's not even a temptation for me. I don't want to give you any money at all. <laughs> but here it really looks like Jesus is really tempted. He's really wrestling with the reality of what it's going to cost to go through with dying on the cross. And in a, in a real way, and again, I want to be real clear, Jesus never sinned. But in a real way, it was like his flesh was, his spirit was willing, but his flesh was weak. And that's what it feels like for us, doesn't it? We want to do the right thing, but, but our flesh is weak about the right thing. Which one are we going to choose? And, and Jesus, we see here in a way we don't see anywhere else in Scripture that he, he was feeling weak. Again, he never sinned. I'll be 100% clear about that. But he was actually tempted to do something at the cost of obedience to God. And then, but what we see Jesus do when he's being tempted is what I want us to focus on. Verse 39. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. In the face of great temptation, Jesus prayed. He felt weak. And to align himself with God's will, to find the way out that God the Father had for him, he prayed. He connected to God the Father in prayer. And if we want to be spiritually strong, we need to feed our spirit with prayer, right? Because Jesus didn't just pray in, in the garden of Gethsemane. We see all throughout scripture, it says he's with a crowd of people and he turns and he goes to a, high, a, a, a lonely place and he prays. Taking time to be with God was part of the regular rhythm of Jesus's life on earth. And so we, if Jesus, Bible guy, If Jesus needs to turn to God in prayer, how much more do we need to develop our prayer lives? Conversations with God should be overflowing in every area of our lives. Our prayers don't always have to be a prayer session that may last minutes. Maybe some of you have prayed for a half an hour or maybe some people have prayed for an hour. Our prayers don't have to be that long. Even in a prayer session, they could be just a couple of, couple of minutes. Sometimes our prayer can be rapid-fire prayers, right? God, help me. God, give me the strength. God, lead me away from this temptation. Because if Jesus needed prayer, then we need to develop our prayer lives and feed our spirit 
with prayer. In the next steps, there are some resources for you uh, of how to structure a regular prayer time with God. Because sometimes it can be awkward. What do I say? God, and then laundry list of people that we want to pray for. (laughs) I won't tell that story. I won't tell that story. Um, so there's, a, uh, there's an acronym for you to follow that can just kind of be an easy structure of prayer time. Um, the acronym is P-R-A-Y. I mean, you can find that, again, at the next steps, which are also available online. And it's just an easy outline for you to begin to develop prayer in your life. Because in order for us to be spiritually strong, we need to connect with God in prayer. One of the other things I noticed whenever I read the Gethsemane story is, is what happened at the very beginning. Actually, it's kind of a part of the story that happened at the very beginning. It says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. But then it says this, He took Peter and James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. I just, think it's, I just think it's noteworthy that in the midst of his temptation, Jesus didn't go to the garden alone. He took a few of his closest friends in the faith. Now, I don't know if Jesus needed to be connected to God's people for him to be strong against temptation that day. But what I do know is that when Jesus was facing temptation, he took his friends with him. And what I know about life and what you know about life and what we see in Scripture and in other, in other places in Scripture is that this is the third thing we need to be spiritually strong against temptation, to feed our spirit with the right people. 1 Corinthians 15.33, Paul says to the church in Corinth in a letter he wrote, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. And we all know that's true, Right? Whenever we see our kid hanging out with a kid that's mean or dishonest, a little part of us dies inside, right? That's because we know this basic truth, bad company corrupts good character. And so we see our kid hanging out with the kid that's it's kind of a bad influence, and we do what we can to discourage that relationship because we know that that rubs off on others. But the opposite is also true. When our kid hangs out with the kid who like has really good grades and and is kind and and is obedient to their parents, if we're being honest, that's part of it, um, we celebrate. And we want to do everything we can to nurture that relationship. And we might even say, let's, ho- let's, let's host a play date. What can we do to like, help these kids become better friends? Like, don't go back over there to Billy. Billy's a bad kid. We've got to be over here to Jimmy. Jimmy, yeah, great. We love Jimmy. Oh, how's Jimmy doing? Billy, I don't remember Billy. Who's he? Him? You're still friends with him? After all the stories? It's, oh, whatever I called this kid, Timmy. Is that what I said? Oh, Timmy, Jimmy, Bimmy, whatever it is. Oh, such a great kid. Do you want to have him over? I'll buy you any, any dessert you want for dinner tonight. Like, oh, yeah, I love Jimmy. He's the best. Whatever the name is, I lost it. Um, and it's not that being around the wrong people makes you do the wrong thing. But being around the wrong people never helps you do the right thing. And please hear me clearly. I'm not saying... Don't have relationships with people outside the church. I think it's important to have relationships with people outside the church. I'm saying if you're trying to fight a temptation, you might need a friendship upgrade. There might be some friendships that you need to say, this might be not as helpful for me as I'd like it to be. Maybe you've been spending time around people who lead you right into temptation, right? You're hanging out with Becky, and Becky's always asking you for the latest hot juicy gossip about Jill, Or maybe you're hanging out with Bill, who always wants to go to the bar, but you're trying to stay sober, and he knows that. But he still wants to go to the bar. Bad company corrupts good character. If we want to be spiritually strong, we need to feed our spirit with the right people. We don't just want to be around people who aren't pushing us towards temptation, We also want to make sure we're spending time with people who are pulling us toward God. We want to be around people who will support us 
and encourage us in our faith. Helping us to be faithful to God. Helping us to be great parents, great spouses, great neighbors. People who honor God in everything that we do. Because while bad company corrupts good character, good company will help us develop a stronger faith. It will help us develop good character. We feed our spirit with the right people. We feed our spirit with prayer. And we feed our spirit with God's word. And when we do this, we become spiritually strong. So that our hearts are so focused on God and the things of God that our desire for the things of the world will begin to fade away. It's been such a blessing this week. Many of you have reached out and said, I was sitting with a friend of mine and I almost said something. And then the Lord convicted me and said, that's gossip. And I said, I better not say that. And I know that we're all in this battle with temptation together. None of us are above it. None of us are too holy that we don't have to face it. Even Jesus faced it. So it's not that we're never going to be tempted, but as as we develop these things in our lives, as we become spiritually strong, we'll desire more things that are godly, like many of you already are and have been in your life. And we actually begin to desire the things of God, the things like justice and mercy in love for our neighbor. Temptation won't go away, but Lord willing, when we are tempted, we will more easily see the way out that God has for us and will be more likely to say, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. As we close, I want to share with you a few ways to live out this message throughout this week. Now, in the next step, I put some resources uh, for you of how to live some of this stuff out. And again, there are paper copies out there and um, digital copies online. I'd encourage you to check those out. Um, But this week, we have a different kind of opportunity that I wanted to share with you. Many of you know that there is an app called the Bible app. Uh, It's by YouVersion. Um, It's also available on a web browser on a computer, but it's uh, best on a phone, in my opinion. And on the Bible app, there are Bible reading plans. Um, And on the um, next steps, you'll find a link to, I think it's belfonfaith.com slash Bible plans. And there are five Bible plans that are connected to these couple of things that we've been talking about over the course of this series. One's on how to develop a prayer life. One is on how to get started reading the Bible. One is on, uh, it's called All About the Holy Spirit. And I think at least the fourth one is about um, gratitude, just a Bible reading plan. Um, to just be reading the Bible. <clears throat> but one of the things I really like about the YouVersion Bible app is that these Bible reading plans, you can do them as an individual. So you can just start the Bible reading plan. It'll have a devotion. It'll have some scriptures down below that you can read as well. It'll send you reminders, which is great. But one of the features I really like is you can start a plan with friends. Um, and so we are going to have this week two different Bible reading plans that you can join that will involve other people from the church. Um, so we'd encourage you, if you go on to belfonfaith.com slash Bible plans, um, you can click the link and it'll be an invitation for you. Uh, you'll probably have to log in and all that stuff and create an account um, with YouVersion. Um, but you can join a Bible reading plan for just this week to just be intentional about feeding our spirit with, um, with prayer, feeding our spirit with God's word. And by doing it together, we're feeding our spirit with the right people. The plans start tomorrow morning. Um, and so again, this is just a fun thing for us to do this week to, um, to connect with one another as we connect to God's word together. Um, so if you're interested, be sure to sign up. Uh, last I checked, the web browser version, I couldn't get it to join from there. So you might have to do it from your mobile phone. Um, but again, it'll be, a, it'll be a fun time to do that together this week. Um, and I think I forgot to say, the best part about the Bible reading plan as a group of people is... After you're done, there's a social aspect. So you can comment and say, hey, here's what I thought was interesting. Here's what I thought was helpful. Or if you're just looking for accountability, done. (laughs) And sometimes that's just what we need, right? Again, you can find that link on the digital bulletin and that link's on the the, um, next steps in in the lobby as well. But whatever you do, in our battle with temptation, attach yourself to God this week and in the coming weeks. Find ways to feed your spirit with God's word, feed your spirit with prayer, 
and feed your spirit with the right people. Because when we do that, we're going to become spiritually strong and we will be stronger against temptation. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. God, we are so thankful today that you always provide a way out. We're thankful that even when we don't always take the way out, your love for us is great. It's like the, it's like the, the parable of the lost sheep. There's a shepherd and there's, the shepherd has a hundred sheep and one of them goes and wanders off and gets lost. And you are the good shepherd who leaves the 99 to go find the one who's lost. And, and even whenever we feel lost and, and we're not living out the way, we're not living our lives the way that you are calling us to, we're not living life the way that we want to be living life, we're thankful that you reach out and you grab our hand and you invite us back and you walk us back. And so God, this week, is, as we have another opportunity to, to realign ourselves with your will and realign ourselves with who you are, we pray that you would speak to us, encourage us, and um, help us to follow you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.